Hi there, thanks for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul at Texas A&M Kingsville, and this video is entitled Poetic Speakers and Audiences, and I'll be talking a little bit about some of the different ways we can think about the speaker in a poem, uh, who's talking, and, and how that helps us to understand what's happening in a text. It's important to note right off the bat that the author and the speaker are two very different people. The author or poet is the real person who has written the text, but the speaker is a character, a fictionalized character that the author is performing or constructing through their words. So it's much like an actor performing a character. And this word persona is very important. It comes from the Latin for mask. So the speaker is a persona, it's a mask. You might also note that the word persona is also the root of our word personality. So in the sense, really, our own personalities, who we are, the way we behave to other people, is in fact a mask. To say that again, our personalities are masks. This is why even when a poet is writing in the first person, even if they are writing in their own name and of their own biography and personal experience, it is still, there is still a difference between the author and the speaker. Consider for a moment, what persona do you put on when you're talking to your parents, or your boss, or your friends, your significant other? Which one of these is the real you? Even if you are telling about some factual experience, some experience that you've had in life, the words that you speak, the way you present it, and the personality you present will be different if you're telling that story to your parents versus your friends. So even when the author is speaking autobiographically, we still must make a distinction between author and speaker because the speaker is the way the author has chosen to construct that expression of the author's biographical experience. There are, of course, an infinite t number of types of speakers in poetry, uh, but there's some major categories that we can think about. Uh, oftentimes, the speaker is a fictional character. The example of A River Merchant's Wife, A Letter. Ezra Pound, the author, was an American man. Uh, the poem is written from the perspective of a young Asian woman. So obviously, not the same person. So here is a fictional character that the speaker is, that the poet is embodying as the speaker. The poet is imitating or giving voice to the ideas of this fictional character their expressions. The speaker could also be a representative of a group of people. For example, let America be America, in which certainly there is an individual voice in that poem, but the speaker repeatedly says things like, I am the poor white farmer, I am the Indian, etc., etc. So the speaker is explicitly representing not just him or herself, but various groups of people, speaking on behalf of many to the audience. Sometimes the speaker is a kind of persona or fictional version of the poet, of the self. So for example, in Theme for English B or Silhouette, both of which are expressing Langston Hughes's experiences and ideas, but not limited just to being an autobiographical report. Uh, and it's Langston Hughes performing himself in a certain way, performing a certain aspect of his identity to his audiences. The speaker can also be an inanimate object or a, a sort of concept personified, like in Carl Sandburg's poem, Grass. And there, the grass is obviously not something that can literally talk, that can literally speak, but by occupying that perspective, by creating, giving voice to the perspective of this inanimate object, this element of nature that's outside of humanity, we get a different perspective on human experience. So the speaker as the first person persona gives a kind of very particular individual experience, but that still is attempting to connect to some larger uh, meaning, some larger issues that relate to the audience, to the readers. And then the speaker as an inanimate object is often completely outside of the human experience, yet still giving a perspective on it.
And finally, poetic speakers are often just that, poetic speakers. They're poetic voices. These observers that are certainly human, that have a personality, intellect, opinions, attitudes, emotions, but there's something a little bit uh, detached, perhaps, or uh, inspired, we might say, visionary, or just unusual about their perspective. It's not necessarily something that we could identify to a particular individual, like Emily Dickinson and a bird came down the walk. We could say this is Emily Dickinson, but there's also something impersonal or, or suprapersonal above the, the individual about this poetic voice. And this is, in some ways, all poetry. The speaker is this poetic voice, because as I've said before, even though poetry often mimics or expresses or describes everyday experiences, there's always something a little bit heightened, a little bit uh, theatrical, a little bit artistic about it. There's something that raises it above the level of just normal experience and normal observation. So there's always this poet's voice being uh, uh, expressed in by the speaker. Sometimes it's more direct. Sometimes there, there doesn't seem to be any individual at all. And so it's just this poetic observer. So keep in mind this, there's always this perspective above the reality of the situation. Just as there are an infinite number of types of speakers, there's an infinite number of types of audiences. But again, some major categories that we might think about. So oftentimes, just as there's a specific speaker, they're often addressing a very specific person or figure. So a mother to her waking infant, a river merchant's wife, a letter. Both of these have definite speakers, defined speakers and defined audiences, and a definite relationship between speaker and audience. Mother, child, wife, husband, and this will often bring to mind certain expectations, presumptions, ideas about the nature of the relationship, the nature of the conversation. And these are useful, but of course, we always want to make sure that we don't impose our own ideas. So we might have our own th thoughts about what a wife and husband's relationship might be, but the wife-husband relationship in the poem might be very different. So thinking about the definite relationship, if there is there one there, that can help us to define the situation a little bit more clearly, to understand the possible ways that these figures might be interacting with one another. slightly more abstract, there's sometimes an unspecified you. There isn't a definite relationship, but we can still figure it out based on the poem. So for example, this is just to say, how do I love thee? The relationship between the speaker and audience isn't defined, so we don't know if this is 
husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, 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 boyfriend, boyfriend. We have no idea the exact nature of their relationship, but we can tell some things. We know that they love each other. We can tell that there's a certain amount of intimacy, perhaps a certain amount of rivalry, right? The relationship is revealed in the poem, but there still is some kind of uh, relationship there, some kind of definite connection, even if we don't know their particular roles. Oftentimes in a poem, even if there is a specific relationship between the two figures, um, the, the at audience might be identified as a specific person or type of person with a definite relationship to the speaker. They are also not just an individual, but they're a representative of some larger group. So the definite relationship between the speaker and the audience and the roles they play in that relationship is a model of some social relationship. So a prime example would be silhouette, where we have the speaker, who we can assume is probably, given that it's a Langston Hughes poem, usually he writes from the perspective of an African-American man speaking to the Southern gentle lady. So these are specific people, an individual, man and an individual woman talking to each other but of course they stand in for they represent also african americans as a whole and white women in the south as a whole and we could go beyond that to say well they represent the oppressed and those who have the power to help the oppressed there's a lot of different ways we can start building out what it is that these individual relationships relate to or how they communicate to us something about larger social relationships. And often in poems where there isn't a specific audience defined or the relationship between audience and speaker isn't defined, if we don't know the roles that they play in that relationship, it's a sort of generalized you, a generalized other. And this can be a singular you, a speaker talking to an imaginary friend or other person, like in A Bird Came Down the Walk. We have this sort of strange poetic speaker talking to some imagined other voice. Or it could be a plural you, as in let America be America again, where the individual speaker that's reciting these words, not only do they represent various groups of the oppressed, but they're talking to not just one person, but to all of us, to all Americans, to anyone who has the power or interest in making America be America, the land of the free and so forth. So this is a kind of plural generalized view that the speaker is There are also some special types of audiences, I'm calling them. They're a little bit different from our normal concept of uh, an individual person or group of people. Just like a speaker can sometimes occupy the position of an inanimate object or concept, something non-human. Similarly, uh, they can be addressing, the speaker might be speaking to an inanimate object, a place, a concept, a non-human being, or something that can't respond. So for example, the lamb and the tiger, or a mother to her waking infant. In these, the audience can't actually hear or respond to what they're saying. So this leads us to ask the question, what is the speaker's purpose? Why are they talking to this lamb, this tiger, this infant child that can't speak? Who is their true audience? Or who else are they addressing? Who are they addressing through their address to the lamb, the tiger, the infant?
The speaker might also be speaking to themselves. They might be their own internal audience. They could be thinking out loud in the lamb or a bird came down the walk. The speaker is addressing their speech to someone, but it's almost an excuse for them to explore their own ideas, to, as I say, think out loud, to, to try to understand what is this lamb? What's happening with this bird? It's almost like a, a meditation. The speaker might be trying to persuade themselves in as much as the river merchant's wife is, is writing to her husband and reminiscing to her husband and asking her husband to come back. She's also perhaps talking to herself, trying to comfort herself through these memories, tell herself that she loves this man, convince herself that it's going to be okay. And they could be reminiscing or lost in memory, like into a daughter leaving home or also a river merchant's wife. Again, they are talking to someone else, but as they speak, the memory the poem is almost more about their own experience of that memory than whatever information they're communicating to the other person. The mother into a daughter leaving home is thinking about her relationship to her daughter. The story is almost more for herself than it is for the daughter. Often the audience isn't even there. The speaker is speaking to an absent individual. In A River Merchant's Wife, a letter, she is writing to her husband. He's not there. But in a larger sense, she doesn't know if that message will ever really reach him. Every time you send a letter, there's always the possibility that it won't get to its destination. So in some sense, is she really talking to him? What is her purpose in addressing this absent individual? Again, how much is it perhaps also an address to herself? In Rothke's My Papa's Waltz, we might think, and, and I, I always feel like the father is not really there. Father is perhaps deceased or just absent. The speaker is remembering this, this uh, event, this waltz dance with their, their father as a child. But again, the father might not be the direct, the, the actual intended audience. Again, there's a sense in which the speaker is reminiscing, talking to himself about this memory. So we think if they're talking to someone who's not there, why? What, what is the purpose served in talking to someone who's not there? Is it an attempt to recover something that's lost? Are they, again, really speaking to themselves? Are they trying to reach out to this other person who they can't reach? These are also some possible ways of thinking about the relationship between the speaker and an absent audience.
finally, somewhat similar in that vein, are poems in which God or Jesus or some divine being is being addressed. Poems like John Donne's Holy Sonnet 14, We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. These are poems in which the poem is a prayer. It might be explicitly written as a prayer, or it might be more of a, a kind of spontaneous outburst, or seem like a spontaneous outburst of emotion directed towards the deity. So they're speaking to this being that is in some sense absent, uh, or perhaps in some sense pres omnipresent, present everywhere, or both, both present and absent in some sense. And again, it's also somewhat self-directed. Every prayer is an expression of the self, of one's own hopes and fears and desires. So in praying to your deity, you are also praying to your own, uh, uh, your own hopes. You're praying to your own vision of what you hope life will be. And we might ask ourselves, who else is listening? Why is this prayer being shared with us? Is the speaker performing their piety? Are they showing off their piety? Are they modeling what it means to be a true believer for their audience, for their readers? Are they showing us this is how one talks to God or how one should talk to God? Or perhaps they might be showing us something about our own relationship to divinity that we might not realize. A poem like Holy Sonnet 14 in which the speaker expresses their own fear of uh, uh, of being damned, fear of damnation. That is both an expression of their own individual fear and anxiety, but also perhaps the anxiety that all believers must have, not knowing truly what awaits us after life. In his poem, Song of Myself, the American poet Walt Whitman writes, I contain multitudes. And that's a very important concept to keep in mind when, when reading poetry, and I think an important concept just to keep in mind in life. No one person is just one thing. And every speaker gives us multiple perspectives. We, we can look at these speakers on different levels, and they voice multiple ideas, multiple perspectives. There's the general, there's the particular, and there's the universal. In A River Merchant's Wife, a letter, we might approach it first thinking about the general type, a wife or a person in a romantic relationship? What are the perspectives that wives or people in romantic relationships have? What do they want? What do they do? What do they need? What are their problems? We might first think about this general perspective on the speaker and the speaker as voicing this general perspective. But then as we read the poem further, we look at the particular individual. This isn't just any wife. This isn't just any person in a romantic relationship. It's a very specific person. It's a 16-year-old child bride who's alone in her home, perhaps for the first time in her life, alone without this husband that's defined her for the last few years, that's defined her entire adult life, such as it is. So we see not just the general experience, but we see the very particular individual experience. And that can lead us out to a kind of universal or broader human experience. This feeling of loss, her loneliness, her desire to be reunited with her husband, her resentment at her husband, perhaps. These things go beyond both the general and the particular, but they unite all of it together. So think about the multiple perspectives that the speaker offers and that we can have on the speaker. And the speakers are also always addressing multiple audiences. There is, of course, the immediate intended audience of the poem silhouette, 
within the world of the poem, the speaker is talking to the Southern gentle lady, that very specific person, that individual. But there is a second indirect intended audience. That is all white women of the South. She is not just one Southern gentle lady. She is all Southern gentle ladies. And in telling this one Southern gentle lady that she is in some way implicated in the lynching of, uh, of the black man, all white women of the South are in some way implicated. And then there's perhaps the tertiary or extended indirect audience. The public, anyone concerned with racial discrimination or even broader, any reader. We are not the direct audience. I am not a Southern gentle lady, nor am I a white woman in the South. Yet the poem is still addressed to me in some sense, in the way that I am part of the public, in the way that I am someone who's concerned about racial discrimination, who's living in this same world. And there's also sometimes an unintended or unconscious audience. And often when we're thinking about the poet or the speaker, excuse me, as a kind of fictional character, the, the river merchant's wife probably doesn't realize how much she is addressing herself, how much of, of the speech is not just to her husband, but to her own fears and insecurities. Or in a poem like La Migra, where the, the speakers are speaking to each other within the world of the poem, but we are spying or overhearing it. So from the perspective of the characters of the two speakers, we're unintended. We're an, uh, an audience they don't know about. Obviously, from the point of view of the poet, the poet is staging this scene for us to be, for us to overhear, for us to spy on. So there's these multiple levels of audience and we have to occupy all these different levels or try to see the poem from these different perspectives, just as we try to see the speaker from these different perspectives of universal general particular. So to sum up the lesson or the importance of this idea of containing multitudes, always remember human beings, including yourself, we are complex, we are emotional, and we are irrational. No matter how logical we can learn to be, we are still animals. And we are still always going to be plagued by our irrationality and our emotionality, or sometimes our emotionality and irrationality are boons, our benefits, they help us. So when reading poetry, be open to contradictions, paradoxes, inconsistencies. People are inconsistent in their beliefs, in their attitudes, in their desires. The river merchant's wife wants her husband home, but at the same time, there clearly is some fear that their relationship cannot be repaired, or perhaps even some resentment that he has left her alone. So there's a contradiction there, and that's a very real human contradiction. And this, I think, extends to thinking about yourself and your own beliefs, your own ideas. We are inconsistent in our lives. We can be hypocritical. We can apply standards to one person and not hold ourselves to those standards. So being open to the contradictions and paradoxes in poetry makes us more open to them in ourselves. And so as we change, the meaning or meanings of the poem will also change and deepen. A poem like this is just to say, if you are 12 or 13, it seems pretty simple. It's a child apologizing to their parent or perhaps a sibling teasing their other sibling. But as you get older, the possibilities of, those relation, of that relationship changes and it becomes more complex and you can see more subtleties. Maybe they're roommates. Maybe they are lovers. Maybe this isn't a mockery or an apology, but something much more complex. So be attentive to the multitudes in poetry. Let's take a quick break and then finish up. As I've said, there's overlap between these different types of speakers. The speaker could be a fictionalized version of the self, but also speaking on behalf of some other large group, and also in some sense trying to detach themselves from the situation and observe it as a poet. 
So what do we write about speakers? Well, perhaps the most obvious way we can approach speakers is the way we approach people in our real life. And that is by observing those social categories of identity that appear in the poem and may influence the speaker, may have influenced who they are, their life, may influence their situation, the language that they speak, and so forth. So things like their sex or gender, their sexuality, race, ethnicity, ethnicity, nationality, religion, culture, social or economic class, education, and so forth. So these are all categories that we might use to describe the speaker, but it's very important here, just as in real life, that we beware of stereotypes. So just because, and this is also very important for differentiating between the author and the speaker, to what extent is, are these social categories important, not just for us, but to the speaker themselves? How does it shape the dramatic situation of the poem? So for example, in The River Merchant's Wife, A Letter, the fact that it is a woman speaking is very important but it might not be important in a poem like The Golf Links, which is written by a woman, but the gender of the poem, the gender of the speaker, does not concern us there. Similarly, in a poem like Let America Be America Again, or Theme for English Be, or Silhouette, the race of the speaker, in all cases, in all those cases, an African-American male, is very important because that is part of the message that the speaker is speaking about. They're talking about race. So in those cases, these issues do shape the understanding of the poem. But we want to be careful about applying stereotypes or our own biases or even just our own uninformed or perhaps ignorant or naive attitudes. So it's also an opportunity when reading poem, when reading poetry, to engage in a little bit of self-criticism. What expectations do you have based on reading a poem that is spoken by or written by a woman, an African American, uh, an Arab, a person of Muslim faith, a Christian, a Jew, etc., etc.? What expectations do you have based on those social categories of identity, and how might you disrupt those expectations through being more open in your reading to the poem of the poem? We can be more precise and literary in our analysis of a speaker if we consider a few categories, some basic categories here that I've labeled voice, tone, and diction. Voice being the personality, the style, or point of view of the speaker. What kind of person is this? This is often a, a, a rather broad or sort of general category that is very descriptive of the speaker's personality as a whole. And then we can talk about their tone. What is their attitude towards the subject that they're speaking about or the audience to whom they're speaking? What emotions are expressed through the speaker's words? And this can be a little bit more finely grained. A speaker might express multiple tones or multiple attitudes in a poem. They might at one point express an attitude of affection and another point an attitude of anger. So this is a little bit more specific. And then even more specifically, the diction. What are the particular words that the speaker uses, the types of language that the speaker uses to communicate themselves and their ideas? And we might note here, voice as the broadest, diction as the most specific category. The diction is what creates the tone and even further creates the voice. It is through the specific words that we understand the tone and the voice. Yet on the other hand, by understanding who this person is on a broad sense, that can help us to pinpoint why particular words are used and what they might communicate when coming from that person. So there's a balance and a back and forth between all of these overlapping categories. Let's look at a couple examples. If we wanted to talk about Langston Hughes's poem, Let America Be America Again, and we wanted to say some things about its voice, the voice of the speaker in that poem, we would note that there are a lot of direct declarative sentences and commands. That tells us something about this person's personality. We would notice that there's a language of freedom and equality that also tells us about this personality and their concerns, the speaker's intentions or ideas. 
notice how we're already getting into diction even when we're talking about voice. So we're getting into the specifics even though we're talking about this broad category. And we might note that there are also a lot of exclamations and powerful images and a sense of intense emotion getting already into tone here. These are all things that help us characterize the general voice of this speaker in this poem. It's a speaker who has a powerful voice, an impassioned voice, a direct voice, a politically motivated voice, and a voice that is dedicated to freedom, equality, etc. Another example, thinking about tone or tone of voice in The River Merchant's Wife, a letter. What attitude does she display in her language? So, for example, the line, at 14 I married my lord you. That title that she gives, as well as the syntax, suggests a respectful tone or a tone of awe or deference. There are a number of different ways it could be described. I desired my dust to be mingled with yours forever and forever and forever. There, she's literally expressing a desire that she's had. And that repetition, and again, the syntax, the lack of any punctuation and the repetition and intensity of that forever and forever and forever could imply a sort of wistful tone, as well as an overflow of emotion, maybe a nostalgia, maybe also affection. So these are all the tones, the attitudes she's expressing here. And the question she asks, why should I climb the lookout? There's a kind of offhandedness to that that seems to speak of her confidence to her husband, that she's confident in their love. She doesn't need to check up on him. So there's a tone of nonchalance, a kind of uncaring. Not that she doesn't care about the situation, but that she's not worried. And we might also say, though, is she overdoing it a little bit? Is she being too nonchalant, too confident? And if so, what might her tone then reveal, even contrary to its explicit presentation, it might reveal something about a hidden fear underneath. Finally, an example of diction in Theodore Rothke's poem, My Papa's Waltz. Just the title alone gives us a very interesting example of how diction can create meaning for us. There's two very contrasting words in this title. Papa, which is an informal word, it's childish, it's something a, a child calls their father, and there's an affection there. Whereas waltz, which is a type of dance, it's very formal, elegant, mature. So we have that contrast in the title between informality, childishness, affection, and the formality or elegance or maturity of the waltz. And so that choice of words, that choice of contrasting meanings, then continues through the poem. We see that most of the words are fairly simple and thus could be spoken by a small boy or a young man. But also there are a couple more sophisticated words, like the word countenance, which a child probably wouldn't use. So who is speaking this poem is revealed to us by the specific words. While there are those childish words, there is also sophisticated vocabulary that indicates clearly this must be an adult, but an adult who's remembering a childhood memory, and thus in some ways is reliving that experience. So is using language and experiencing feelings from both their present day and the past. So just very simple choice of words and the difference between those words, the types of words that are used, reveals quite a bit about this speaker and the situation and the meaning that might be communicated in this speech and memory. So to review, that all-important distinction between the author and the speaker, even if the author is speaking in first person, in their own name, of their own autobiographical experiences, there's still an act of performance. There's still a fictionalization. There's still a persona or mask that the author is creating. Just as no matter who you're speaking to, you're always performing a slightly different version of yourself to that person. So we can never reduce a poem merely to autobiography. And the speaker expresses him or herself through their language and also reveals him or herself through the language. It's through their words that we understand who this person is, how they feel about what they're saying, 
what they want, how they think about themselves, and so forth. It's the language that tells us who they are. And so in this way, in some sense when thinking about a speaker, what they are saying, the literal words, is less important than how it is said, especially when we're thinking about tone or voice. This is not to say that, of course, the specific words are unimportant, but it's the way they use those words to express themselves that tells us who they are. So a final thought. Can you ever fully know another person? Well, we might get very, very close, but no matter what another person tells us about themselves, no matter how open or honest they can be, there's always some gap between what we can learn through their words and what they really feel or experience. So be open to the differences, no matter how much a speaker in a poem might be revealing themselves to you or how much you think you know them or that type of person. Be open to the differences in perspective and experience that are presented by that speaker's words and don't presume to understand them too quickly. A piece of advice that's good not only for reading poetry but also in your general interactions with other people.